Today, I'm very happy to be joined by a Houston basketball legend, someone that we all love here in Houston, one of the greatest Houston Rockets ever. He created, of course, the historic kiss of death. Mr. Mario Eli, thank you so much for joining today, sir. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Uh, looking forward to chopping you up with it, chopping it up with you, big man. So Absolutely. thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm sure you get a lot of questions about the kiss of death, but, um, you know, being one of the younger generations of Rockets fans, uh, some of us never got to see those moments. So I really wanted to ask you a few questions about that. Was it something that you had planned to do or was it just in the moment you just got the idea? It, it was in the moment, but it, it was funny you asked that question. Uh, it started in game five. Uh, me and Joe Klein, you know, we were just going at each other. He'll make a basket. He'll blow a kiss at me. I would make a basket. And it was all a just fun and jest. But of course, you know who got the last and final kiss. Of course. And I want to thank I want to thank Danny Ains for doubling off me in the backcourt. <laughs> Kenny being the great point guard he is, he saw the double team. He found Robert at half court. You know, Robert being 6'10", conservative floor. And uh, when you're playing with two top 50 greatest players, they're not leaving those two guys, Clyde and Dream. So it left me open. So Robert found me in the corner. And Danny Shea said, should I leave Elijah one under the basket? No, that's not a good idea. Because if he'd have left Dream, I would have just dropped it right to the big fella. So it allowed me a little time to get my feet set. That's what happened when you play with great players. They allow you to get open shots. So he didn't want to leave Dream. So it allowed me to get that shot off and uh, looked at Joe Klein and blew him the kiss of death. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, you know, I did watch the replay of that game and uh, it was a great pass by Robert Ory um, to find you in the corner there. And, um, you know, the 27th anniversary of the shot just passed. I think it was one of the one of the greatest moments in Rockets history and NBA history because it allowed the Rockets to make that 3-1 comeback against the Suns in the 95 semis. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to know uh, your emotions on the kiss of that shot as well. Uh, one of my teachers in school, huge Rockets fan, he wanted me to ask you this question specifically what uh, your emotions were. Well, it started um, when we were down 3-1. Um, you know, us having no home court that whole playoff run, uh, us winning it the year before and uh, listening to Kenny every huddle before the game. Uh, we're not losing the series now. Uh, we came too far. So uh, a lot of crazy things happened that series, especially that game five. We were down 3-1 in Phoenix. Clyde's at the hotel with a, with a fever. We don't know if he's going to play or not. I mean, he shows up 40 minutes before the game looking like a dead man. I'm like, how is this dude going to play? But his presence and him playing through a fever, knowing he's not 100%, really lift our ball club that game. And uh, uh, we won in overtime that game, uh, made it 3-2. Then we came, you know, when you come back home, you got a little momentum. Yeah. Then we won game six. Then in game seven, uh, I felt anything can happen, especially when you got two of the greatest players in the planet in Elijah Wan and Drexler. And uh, I just remember, I know everybody remember Kevin Johnson just having an amazing night. This dude was just unstoppable. And uh, he missed the one free throw. He was 21 for 21. And that 22nd free throw he missed, which allowed the game to be tied. Uh, I think the game plan for Phoenix, they didn't want us to take the last shot because it was only 19 seconds. And they knew we were going to hold for the last shot. So I guess them send, sending Danny Ains to double Kenny sort of rushed the process and us being the veteran team we didn't panic we had great spacing out there and um like you mentioned robert threw a great pass went up and got it and right in front of my bench you know right in front of my bench you know raised up you know shot the kiss of death and what's funny about that moment uh really didn't feel my teammates jumping on me i was so locked in that moment if you see me looking at the bench everybody's jumping on me celebrating and I'm busy just staring, <laughs> staring at the sun's bench. I was just caught in the moment, <laughs> excuse me. And then when I got on the bench and I'm like, I really did that, yeah. you know? I sort of, sort of settled down and finally realized what that moment was about. It's funny when you caught up in it, you don't know what you did until you actually like, wow, I put us up three with seven seconds left and we got a chance to go to Western Conference Finals. So 
that was pretty neat. Yeah, that was cold blooded, and uh, that was really <laughs> awesome. Um, and you're also known as the Junkyard Dog. So how did that how did that nickname come about? Because I think it really fits uh, your style of play. I think every team in the NBA they need somebody who's really tough, somebody who gets after people, really good defenders, and just somebody who gives it his all. So uh, how did that nickname come about? Well, I'm just glad to see, first of all, I want to give you examples, guys like Draymond, PJ Tucker, Marcus Smart are some of my favorite guys because when you're a junkyard dog, you do stuff that don't show up in the stat sheet, taking charges, uh, running down a loose ball when there's two guys in front of you that you wanted more than the other guy, guarding all kinds of different positions. You see PJ, you see Draymond, they guard multiple guys. They guard bigs, they guard smalls. I mean, those guys are invaluable. You know, people get caught up in scoring all the time, but it's a role you fit on a team. And uh, I was the perfect piece to the puzzle, to that rocket puzzle, you know, playing with a lot of great Lajuan, Drexler, Vernon Maxwell, Sam Cassell, Kenny Smith. We sort of all knew our roles on the team. And it made for just a fun couple of years being with the Rockets. I mean, people counting us out us in the locker room jamming our music, you know, the whole city's down against us, but you know, we're going down to Phoenix two zip in 94, uh, just on the plane, the music is just jamming and us believing we can get it done. Uh, when you got a group of guys like that, it's a joy to play with. Uh, the great Rudy T said it, you know, we just found ways to win. And we were just a resilient group who didn't give up on anything. Barkley said it best. We're like a cockroach. You <laughs> thought you killed them. You lift your foot up and that roach gets up and skedaddles. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who we were. Just a bunch of rough riders. I love my junkyard dog. You know, I used to get on guys when we were on playing hard. Um, when we lose a game, I'm the only one on the bus just frowning and mad. So that's why guys always call me the junkyard dog. I said, this guy's never happy, always uptight but we'll go out and do whatever it takes for his team to win. And, you know, I want to thank the Rocket fans. In 1997, I was voted one of the top 10 Rockets in the last 30 years. And this is a guy who averaged a career eight or nine points a game. Not like Elijah Wan, not like Barkley, not like uh, Moses, the great Moses Malone, Ralph Sampson, Rudy T, Calvin Murphy. All these guys are Hall of Fame players. And here I am. The fans, you know, they see some guy who who uh, contributes to a championship team, and they said that junkyard dog boy, he was a big part of of that Rocket championship run. Right, and you know, I think your story is that something a lot of people take inspiration from. I think it's one of the reasons why you're so beloved down here. And you know, your road to the NBA wasn't really that easy. You know, drafted in the seventh round by the Bucks, you played overseas and. Ireland, Argentina, and Portugal before you made it to the NBA. So I think it shows tremendous dedication and hard work. And I think it's amazing to see where you are right now. Um, but well, what have been some of your experiences maybe from your time overseas that that you learned a lot from that really helped you um, in the NBA? I, I really uh, thank basketball for allowing me to see the world. I mean, me uh, uh, growing up in New York City, there's, I grew up in Manhattan, right in the city. It's eight to eight to 10 million people there. So uh, my first trip is to Ireland. I'm like, I went to Ireland when I was in college. You know, I played in, in Ireland. We went to Ireland. We really didn't know about, much about the country, but man, did I have a great time there. The people were just amazing. Um, the basketball, all the Americans, you know, you had to score points. I mean, I was averaging 36 points over there. And um, the averages were like 39, 38. Mm -hmm. If you're an American brother, you got to go there and get buckets. So that's what I did. Met some good friends over there. The people there were just so amazing. They didn't see color, most important. You know, I would take the train to downtown Dublin to meet my, the other Americans. And sometimes I'm the only African-American on the train. But people would just, hey, Mario, you play for the Lil Toppers. So they knew who I was. They knew I was a basketball player. And it was just a great experience there. Argentina was fantastic. 
Uh, I think I, I played in a town where Nocioni and Delfino, guys who played in the NBA. So when they see me coaching, said, Mario, you played in my town when I was a little boy. So you, you see, I got the grade. So it made me feel a little old. So I had a great experience there. But the most fun I had in the country was Portugal. I ended up staying there two years. I played in a northern town called Ovar. And me coming from New York, Ovar had two street lights in the whole town. <laughs> so at nine o'clock, you see no people on the street. So here's a guy from New York who's usually being up all night, <laughs> having to go to a town like Ovar where it closes down. But I tell you what, I had the best time. The whole town will come to the games. After the game, me and my teammate, the other American, We'll go to the restaurant. They'll give us free food. We love this so much over there. We had a we won the first championship over there in that city's history in maybe 40, 50 years. I remember celebrating with the with the town. These guys were ripping my clothes off. I said, please don't rip off my underwears. You can have my uniform, my sneakers and stuff. They were trying to take off my underwears. I had to run into the locker room. So it was just a great experience there. And um and I had a chance to work on my game. I felt when I got drafted by the Bucks in 85, I had a lot to work on. So it was my shooting, my dribbling. So I chose my overseas, you know, uh, adventures to do that. And one thing, when I talk to campers, when I talk to guys here in the U.S., I said the guys overseas work 50 times as hard as you guys do. That's why you got Luka, Jokic, Giannis. That's why these guys come over here and have immediate success because these guys are very focused. They really work on their craft. So we're getting a little lazy here in the U.S. We need to catch up because the world is catching up with us. So I tell these kids, get off the video games, get off the phone, get in the gym, get your 500 shots up, go to the backyard, dribble the ball for an hour. So there's always ways you can get better. Yeah, I mean, I think, your experience overseas sounds truly amazing. It seems like you had a really great, you had a blast, honestly, out there. And uh, I wanted to ask that, you know, what, how would you have described your experience as part of the Rockets broadcast this year? Because you joined AT&T Sportsnet this season. Uh, what would you say the experience uh, was compared to your expectations? I loved it. Uh, you know, if you know my wife, she does TV. She's on Channel 13 at 6 and 10. So I got my own personal coach at home. So mm -hmm. every time she would see me on TV, she always had some critiques for me. So that's what she does for a living. So she knows TV. So to have somebody in the house really help you. I love what I do. I love watching basketball. I love talking about basketball. That's what I do. I've been doing it all my life. And um, I've been watching Jalen Green since my son was playing AAU. Um, I remember uh, going to Vegas one time and uh, Jalen Green was in the 10th grade. And oh. I saw, you know, when there is a good player playing, that court always gets full. Mm -hmm. So I go to this one court, I'm like, why is everybody coming to this court? They say, uh, there's a 10th grader named Jalen Green. I'm like, who? He says a 10th grader named Jalen Green and look at him now, first team all rookie for the Rockets. Um, I posted it on Twitter, I congratulated him. I think he's going to get a lot more awards. It was a great pick. Um, he's going to be all-star. Uh, you saw glimpses of his explosion. I think he, second half of the season, I thought he really turned the corner. It takes a while. The NBA is a very tough game. It's a very tough league. And it takes guys a little while to adjust and to figure things out. And I'm excited to see his growth. And I'm very excited to see, we're going to get a good player in this, in this draft. We got the third pick. So we getting one of them three big boys. So I'm really excited to see him, Jalen, KP. Uh, Shangoon's is my fan favorite. I love, oh, yeah. I love, I love Shangoon. Uh, and uh, I like what we're building here. Uh, it's going, our, our turnaround's going to be quick, I think. Our turnaround's going to be quick. We've had a couple of good pieces this year and next year. The Rockets are back, baby. Yeah, I'm really excited as well for the Rockets, I think. You mentioned it, Jalen Green. I'm really excited for him. I think he's going to be a superstar in this league. And, uh, you know, you got to give some players some time. And they can't just come into the NBA and, you know, blast off. I think I was giving Jalen some time, and uh, he showed why he's so great and why he deserved that number two pick. And uh, you're talking about 
uh, the upcoming draft for the Rockets to have the number three pick this year. And it was a big win for the Rockets because we were able to get one of those three guys that we needed. And um, I think it's very important that they did that. So, I mean, who do you think the Rockets would uh, realistically end up with? Because I think it's going to be, in my opinion, I think it's Von Caro. I think he's the most, I would say, the most NBA-ready prospect at the moment. I think a good ball handler, playmaker, good um, good size as well. So um, I think the Rockets would go with him because I don't see Orlando or OKC passing up on Chet Holmgren or Jabari Smith. Would you go with uh, Paulo Von Caro as well? I absolutely, totally agree with you. To me, Jabari Smith should be the number one because to me, he has the highest ceiling. He can do a lot of things. He can shoot the three. He looks like he could defend a little bit. Reminds me of a guy we used to have, number 25 here, Robert Ory. He has a little Robert Ory in him. Then you got Chet, who was the number one player ever since he was in 11th grade. I think he's going to be a really good player. Uh, the thing people don't know about him, he's very tough and aggressive. Just for a skinny kid, he'll put on weight in the NBA. And uh, just his defense, he impacts he impacts the game on both ends of the floor. But I'm with you. To see uh, Van Caro and uh, Jalen Green in the pick and roll, it has me super excited because I'm with you. You're, you're a great scout. This kid can do a lot of things. To go to Duke on the big stage and to play all the big games and to be the top guy and show up in all the games, yeah. I'll be happy to take him at three. I, I mean, I'm real excited because I know we're going to get one of those three guys. I would like for us to really add a veteran. Uh, you see what Hal Harford brings to the Boston Celtics. We need a sort of veteran like that here with the Rockets to show these young guys just how to be pros. Uh, you see how Hal Harford uh, uh uh, carries himself like a true pro. He doesn't complain about anything. He goes out and does his job. And everybody on that Celtic team loves him for that. So if we can get a good veteran like that to go along with our great young core, I mean, I think we're going to be in great shape. I think, I think we've got a bright future. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And like you were saying earlier, I think it's going to be a quicker turnaround for the Houston Rockets. I think they're going to come back really, really soon. And, um, I'm really excited for uh, this team and to see what they have to offer next season. Um, and yeah, I want to talk about the conference finals that are going right now as well. The Western finals is today, game four. Um, Golden State's up three games to none, one game away from reaching the finals once more. Um, what have been your thoughts on this series? Because to me, um, excuse me, uh, to me, it's, all, it's been all about the three for the Mavericks in the playoffs. They just haven't been as consistent from the arc that they need to be. I think Golden State has really dominated the paint and they've done a great job in rebounding. And uh, do you think it's going to end up in a sweep tonight? I think so. Uh, that team has championship pedigree. Uh, when a team smells blood uh, and, you know, and you see Luca in his press conference, he looks defeated a lot of the times when he's talking, you know. But uh, like he mentioned, he's only 23 his first Western Conference Finals. You got to learn. There's yeah. a lot of lessons learned. In, in these playoffs and uh, playoff experience does matter. And uh, the Warriors are just a fine oil machine. And uh, I'm gonna give you something. You remember when the Rockets played the Golden State Warriors and why did we didn't win that series? You remember we missed 27 straight yep. threes? I remember that. So when you miss that many shots, it's okay to go to the basket sometimes. So hmm. Dallas decides, okay, this is how they wanna play. Like I always tell people, there's one, there's only one thing that can be consistent in the game of basketball. Your shooting, you can't control if shots go go in and out. You can control defense and effort. You got to play defense. When your shot is not going, you have to guard. And I think Dallas is not guarding. Dallas is a bigger team. You mentioned it. That Golden State is plus 45 on the backboards. You can't give a good team two or three opportunities, especially the Warriors where you got Clay. Once you get a rebound, Clay and Steph are like salivating at the three point line waiting for Draymond or, or Wiggins to kick it out to them. Those guys make you pay, man. And let's start giving Steph Curry his flowers, please. This dude, does he doesn't get enough credit for how great he is. He may be going to his fourth final 
in the LeBron James era. They're saying he's the GOAT of all time, right? Yeah. But Steph Curry has a lot to say about that. Yeah. Steph Curry been a big thorn in LeBron's side, and he continues to be. So uh, Dallas had a good run. They need a big man. You need, if the threes are not dropping, get to the cup. Get to the cup or get to the foul line. Yeah, that, that's a really great point. And, you know, again, you can't control control your shooting. you got to attack the basket. you got to play harder defense. And, you know, exactly. that's the formula. Um, yes. And then on the other side of the, on the other side, we have the Eastern Conference Finals. They've had pretty much blowouts in every single game. Yeah, right. I know the Celtics won by 20 yesterday, led by 24 at the half. And, um, you know, how do you see the series playing out? Because to me, uh, I, I would favor the Celtics at this point. I think they have more reliable offensive scores like Al Horford, Jalen Brown, Grant Williams, besides Jason Tatum. They also have good size with Robert Williams. So um, I would go with the Celtics. Would you agree with that as well? Yes, and I just think the health also of Miami, Kyle Lowry, poor guy. I mean, he had one good playoff run with Toronto, but his playoff history hasn't been good. And he stays hurt, unfortunately. He brings a lot to the table. Tyler Hero with the hamstring injury. Uh, six man of the year, you need him out there. Jimmy Butler, you know, his knee's been bothering him for a little while now. Give him credit to try to get through it. But to me, this is another team that I feel is just small. I mean, you look at the final four in the NBA right now. I mean, Celtics are the biggest team. To me, Celtics are the most complete team left in this final four. I feel if Boston goes to the finals, I think they can beat the Warriors. And I think they will beat the Warriors because their size and their length. You know, uh, you got Brown, you got Tatum, Smart will be back. Harford's playing at a good level. You got Williams, you got Pritchard, you got White. You got a lot of guys who are contributing for the for the Celtics. But for the Warriors, Steph got to be on like popcorn for them to have a chance. And they're going to have some good defenders on them. They can have Tatum on them sometimes. Yeah. Steph, Steph usually struggles when he has bigger defenders on him. So I think a Boston Warriors series will be fantastic. Miami does a great job. Their culture down there is amazing. But I just think with the injuries, and they don't have no size. Who they have besides Bam? And Bam is only 6'8". So yeah. they really have no big. And you see where our game was going. We're playing like a European brand of basketball. Really no bigs. Space the floor out. Get to the paint. Kick out. Shoot the three. Yeah. We sort of we sort of playing like a European type of basketball right now. Not like when you had Elijah Wan, Ewing, Shaq. Throw it down. Feed the big boys down there. Yeah. Barkley, Malone. Feed the big horses down there. It's a different game. It's a three point game. But I tell everybody, you not you guys are not the Warriors. The Warriors got two of the greatest shooters ever. You guys don't. So stop yeah. shooting all them threes. I'm tired of guys who are 25% three-point shooters launching seven, eight threes a game. That's a formula for disaster, brother. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, not everybody can make those threes at a high percentage clip yes. like play, like Steph. Exactly. I, I know, that's, that's when you got to attack the rim. And uh, Exactly. That's my, it drives me crazy when, uh, you know, like Dallas. Y'all ain't gonna outshoot the Warriors. And it's funny, the Warriors beat them by making twos. You know, the Warriors yeah. beat a Dallas ran them off the line. Steph Curry's glad to take a layup. Steph mm -hmm. Curry don't, you know, Dallas, they'll they'll they exhaust a possession till they get a three off. They'll have a layup in the lane, then they kick it out again. Then the guy I drive again, he'll have a layup, he'll <laughs> kick it out. I'm like, just lay the ball up, guys. Twos are good. I always say twos are good, twos are good. I totally agree. The twos are good. And uh, I want to see, I want to see guys feed the big men inside. I want to see some slams inside there too. Some slams, um, cut off the big. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do. People are not really running offense. It's just switch to pick a roll, ISO basketball, attack the mismatch. That's why I love watching the Warriors because when Clay and Steph don't have the ball, they're cutting, they're setting a back screen, they're diving. That's why those that team is so hard to guard because those guys, it's easy to shoot a moving target. It's hard to shoot a target that's moving. And the Warriors' offensive system is about constant movement. Love to watch them guys play. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, hopefully the NBA Finals will be uh, really good if it is indeed 
uh, Celtics versus Warriors. And uh, I wanted to talk about going back to when you were in the NBA Finals back in, you know, you played in a lot of NBA Finals games. And in 1995, you were in the starting lineup and uh, you played really great basketball, 16 points per game, 65% from the field. And, uh, you know, during the playoff run, you were coming off the bench and you were obviously a big contributor, but during the finals, you came up in, into the starting role. So I want to hear about kind of that transition, how that was decided. Well, a um, lot went on that year. Uh, we played Utah the first round, I remember. And uh, Vernon left the team. I don't know if you remember that story. Vernon, I guess we played our second game in Utah. He was upset about his playing time. Um, and then he sort of left the team. So that's sort of, that's a big piece to the puzzle. I mean, Vernon Maxwell, he saved us at 94 in that game three in Phoenix. He had 31 in the second half. So Vernon was a big piece. So uh, I credit Rudy T. I think it sort of started the San Antonio series. He realized that he could play Robert at the four. He experimented Robert at the four in the Phoenix series. Robert was guarding uh, uh, Barkley a lot in that series. So Rudy's like, mm, we, Elijah Wan got a lot of space in there without a big man next to him. So as he went into the San Antonio series in the Western Conference Finals, I don't know if it was the second or third game, I was injected into the starting lineup and it allowed Dream to have a lot of space because you had four elite three-point shooters out, myself, Kenny, Robert, and Sam, and Clyde. We all can shoot the ball. Then you got the best player in the league, I don't know. I, I hate when people say Jordan didn't come back. He did come back. Nobody said when he had 55 points in the garden. Nobody said nothing about that. Nobody said that Orlando Magic eliminated them and we swept the Magic. Yeah. So I'm tired of people putting the Rockets and the and the Bulls together. We ready to rock and roll. Let's wrap it up right now, Michael. I'm We ready to go. So I get tired of that comparison. People just X us off like we didn't accomplish anything we did accomplish something. You know, the league still goes on with a Michael Jordan. The first year, I may give you that, but the second year he came back. So I don't want to hear that excuse. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think that's, <laughs> I'm tired of hearing that as well. Um, and uh, I have last question for you here. Um, would you ever want to get back into coaching again? Like I know you were an assistant coach for the Mavs, for the Kings, Nets and Magic. Um, would you ever want to get back into doing that again? Of course, I love to coach, it's in my DNA. Um, I see the game very well. I enjoy watching film. I enjoy being in the gym. You know, that's why I guess why I made it. Cause I love, I love everything about the game of basketball, the preparation, getting a guy better. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Monte Ellis when I was in Golden State, nobody knew about him. I worked with him and he ended up getting $66 million <laughs> and being the, six man of the year. So those are the things that brings joy to my heart. When I was coaching with Avery Johnson um, with the Mavericks, I was working with Jason Terry. He got the six man of the year and he made sure to mention me to thanking me for working with him every day. So those are the awards I love. That's what I love about coaching is seeing the reward, the guys who put in the hard work. And then you really see why the great players are great. Uh, watching Dirk Nowitzki work on a daily basis you see why he's a great player. Uh, who else did I uh, coach? Joe Johnson, uh, Darren Williams coaching those guys in Brooklyn. You see why those guys were special talents. So love coaching, uh, love being on the plane, watching the game after a win or loss, uh, breaking down the clips, looking forward to showing the guys the clips the next day. You know, the good and the bad, you got to show them both. You can't just yeah. punish a guy, but uh, yeah. I would love to get back, but the only way I would get back is to work with a guy like Sam Cassell, who, who should have been a head coach by now. you got a lot of good young coaches out there who are friends of mine. Popeye Jones is with Denver right now. Darwin Ham is up for the Laker job. He's a guy I may consider working for, but Sam Cassell is my guy. If he would get a head job, is a guy what I would love to work with because I know he, he's a point guard. He sees the game at an elite level. He's doing a great job as a coach right now. You know, did a great job with John Wall. I mean, he's been with Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers can't go nowhere nowhere without Sam Cassell. So that tells you a lot about his skill set. So 
I'm praying for my brother to get a job. If he would get a job, that's a guy I would love to work with. All right. You know, I wish you the best of luck in that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you might be able to get back in there. And uh, Mario, thank you so much for the time today. I really, really appreciate it. Again, I really enjoyed talking today. And um, I'll be coming out with an interview soon on Twitter. So uh, hopefully you can uh, give it a retweet as well. Of course I will, man. It was great chopping it up with you. Love seeing real Rocket fans. And when I look at that picture, it just brings back just a million memories. I mean, it's a lot of things just looking at that picture, the situation, being down, KJ having a big night. So it's funny when you look at stuff like that, how instantly you remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it was 27 years ago, you remember every moment like it was yesterday. So when I see that, and like you mentioned, I'm a division two player. You know, I was a seventh round pick. You know, I should have I should have never made it, but God bless me, my hard work and persistence. God blesses people like me who put in the work like that and said, this guy deserves this moment. So God just, I didn't want a Kawhi Leonard shot. You remember how his shot bounced like nine times and went in? Yeah. My, mine went on there, brother. It hit the rim. So <laughs> when, it, when I let it go, I knew it was, I knew something was about to happen because it, it felt good. Everything about that shot felt good. And I was correct. And Joe Klein, sorry, buddy, I'll give you the kiss of death. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, you know a lot of a lot of young players are starting to, you know. You see that? You see yeah. everybody taking my kisses away? I'm like, no. did you see? Did you watch TNT? Uh, I don't know if it was yesterday, or the day before. Yeah, I've been watching. I guess the, yeah, the Warriors were playing, and Jordan Poole, they saw Jordan Poole blowing a kiss, and Kenny yeah. Smith said. Mario Ellie, that's the kiss of death. Hey, he looked at Charles Barkley and Charles <laughs> didn't say nothing. <laughs> Charles is still salty from that series. He's still salty. Man, I'm sure wonder if he gets nightmares from that chart. <laughs> he does, because um uh I remember watching on NBA TV Charles Barkley at 50, uh, and he was going through his basketball career. And he was talking about the Paxson shot. He's like, you know what? That Paxson shot didn't bother me. But he said, that Mario Ellie shot <laughs> sticks with me, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I made sure I kept that recorded. It was when Charles turned 50, they did a something on him for an hour talking about his career. So I thought that was pretty cool. So he said, man, that shot, that shot, that stays with me. That yeah. shot bothered me. So it's good that I can uh, stick a thorn in his side here and there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that, all your great stories. I really appreciate it. And uh, once, thank you. once you post this, I don't know if you go post or retweet it. I'll make sure I follow you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thanks you for so your much. time, man. Thank you for. Yeah. Thank you so okay? much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. No Have a good, good evening. You too. Bye bye. Bye.